entertainment for Tuesday evening on BBC One. Telly Addicts at 7 is followed at 7.30 by EastEnders. I like to say, the wheels of justice grind very slowly. It's gonna be all right. Yeah, don't worry about me, I can take it. I'm even beginning to get on with my cellmate, the incredible one. Clean, clean the windows. Forty Towers is at 8. <laughs> Morning, Major. The window, see? Romantic speculation in double first at 8.30. Good morning, Mrs. Ratty. What can I get for you? A pot of tea, please. My lord. Oh. There are promises to be kept in Noble House at 9.30. Perhaps it is real. Of course it's real. Where did you get this? And at 5 past 11, we join Lionel Richie. We're gonna have a party! Yeah! Entertainment all night long for Tuesday on BBC One. In Midlands today, this evening, the woodyard where a schoolboy died experimenting with explosives. And Wolverhampton rallies round the Olympic judo star stripped of his bronze medal. Plus the rest of the day's news at 6.35. Starting shortly over on two, the Tuesday Western, a drama about the Battle of Little Bighorn. This is BBC One. Six o'clock news from the BBC with Nicholas Whittle and Mike Smart. Good evening. The headlines at six o'clock. Mr Kinnock has told the Labour Party that it's got to be able to run a capitalist economy better than the Tories. Such a policy, he said, was not a concession to Thatcherism. Let me tell this party what so many in this party tell me. That the greatest concession to Thatcherism is to let it win again. An IRA bomb has killed a prison officer in Northern Ireland. A former hostage in Beirut celebrates his release after 20 months. But there is no substitute for freedom in this world. Also tonight, how a father turned private eye to trap the man who killed his son. Plus, a hero's homecoming, Peter Elliott and his silver medal. Neil Kinnock has been telling the Labour Party where he wants to take it now that his authority as leader has been overwhelmingly confirmed. He's told the party about the price that has to be paid for victory, about the need for popular policies which would make a Labour victory possible. His speech to the Labour conference had little to say about defence, a rebuke for the left on economic policy and harsh words for the government of Margaret Thatcher. The Tory Britain, he said, was one in which there was no sisterhood, no brotherhood and no neighbourhood. Mrs Thatcher's society, he said, was the me and now society in which caring was regarded as wet. But the main part of the speech, Mr Kinnock's fifth as Labour leader, was an exhortation to his own party to face reality. Afterwards, most of the party applauded him, but Arthur Scargill called the speech quite deplorable. He said it could have been made by the leader of the Democrats. This week, Neil Kinnock has reinforced his mastery of his party. Now he has to win over the voters. Buoyed up by the endorsement of both his leadership and his vision of democratic socialism, his main speech to conference was his chance to press home the case for the new realism, which he believes will win back the voters. With what he called his mandate for change in his own party, his hands were free to attack Mrs Thatcher for her Bodicea-like hostility to Europe, her loads of money ethic, and her belief that there's no such thing as society. No such thing as society. No number other than one. No person other than me. No time other than now. No such thing as society. Just me and now. That's Margaret Thatcher's society. Turning to Mrs Thatcher's recent speech on the environment, he asked, has the sinner repented? But it was clear he doubted she had. She's got to tell us and tell the country how she thinks that it could be possible to protect the local, the national, the international environment from the poisoning and the pillaging now going on by relying 
on the mechanisms of the market which she so much admires. How will it be possible for that to be done? While the Tories were scorned, other parties were simply ignored. Nor was there much on his biggest problem, defence. That'll be the toughest part of the policy review and the most vital if Labour are to become the government in waiting. When we conclude our review next year, and when we resolve upon our policy for fighting the next general election, that policy must be serious about nuclear disarmament, serious about defence indeed, so serious about both objectives that we are capable of earning the democratic power to achieve both objectives. Comrades. The left fear Mr Kinnett will abandon unilateral nuclear disarmament, just as they believe he's abandoning socialism. But he denied there was any slide to the right. Let me tell this party what so many in this party tell me, that the greatest concession to Thatcherism is to let it win again. That is the ultimate concession. Then, for his critics on the left, a stern reminder of the price of ideological purity without power. I'm hardly sick of meeting people in anguish and of having nothing to offer them but sympathy and solidarity when I know we should have the power to give them real hope, real support, real backing, real opportunity. With its emphasis on key words like efficiency, individualism and competitiveness, this was a call for change. It brought a mixed response. It was very exciting on the green issues. He stripped bare Margaret Thatcher's me and now ideology. And I thought he laid a good foundation for himself and a good platform for Labour at the next general election. I found the speech, for example, by Neil Kinnock today quite astonishing, quite deplorable. It was a clear departure from those socialist values. And it was a clear-cut call to run capitalism better than the Tories. And in a speech tonight from the transport workers' leader, Ron Todd, there's an immediate rebuff for Mr Kinnock's new realism. He'll disparage the leadership's basic statement of values and say the policy reviews are short on ideas. As for the reformers, he says they're all sharp suits and cordless telephones. And on defence, he says there must be no dilution of the party's non-nuclear policy. So it seems that for Mr Kinnock's reforms, there are still some big obstacles to overcome. Mr Kinnock's speech. Earlier, the Labour conference decided that breaking the law should not be part of its campaign against the poll tax or community charge. A plan to fight the tax by urging people not to pay was rejected by delegates. Instead, they approved plans to replace the community charge with a combined property and local income tax. A prison officer has been murdered by a terrorist bomb in Northern Ireland. He's the first member of the prison service to be killed for four years. The bomb had been planted under his car and it exploded as the vehicle was being driven through East Belfast. The IRA has said it carried out the attack. The police haven't yet given the name of the dead man. The cordon was placed around a street in Protestant East Belfast, a rare location for an IRA attack but the provisionals had placed this senior prison officer on their hit list and his car was blown apart by a bomb which exploded minutes after he started to drive the vehicle. Not since 1985 has a prison officer been killed by terrorists here. The police are now wondering whether or not it marks the beginning of another concerted IRA campaign against them. The last was in 1979 when nine of them died. This evening, a fire following an explosion at a building in North Belfast used by the Inland Revenue. A bomb warning was given and the area was evacuated. There is a high degree of alert here as Northern Ireland approaches yet another anniversary. It was 20 years ago tomorrow that the present troubles began. Mithileshwa Singh, the Indian citizen who was released from captivity in Beirut last night, has been talking about his 20 months as a hostage. He said he was treated better than he'd, he'd expected, but he said there was no substitute for freedom. It's not thought Mr Singh has any information about the British hostages, though he said three Americans with whom he was held were all OK. Mr Singh is now resting at the US Embassy in Damascus. For a man of 61 who had spent 20 months in captivity, Mithil Ishwa Singh looked in remarkably good shape physically. And as he faced journalists anxious to hear his story and desperate for news of other hostages, he displayed considerable mental agility as well. I don't have any observation or any statement to make except for one thing. Thank God I am free. Have, have they been treating you well? 
I told earlier that treatment was better than I had expected, but there is no substitute for freedom in this world. He was very much aware that a word out of place could rebound on his three colleagues still held. The kidnappers had put out a picture of Mr. Singh bidding them farewell. We four were put together and we lived together all these 20 months. What are your thoughts about your three colleagues now that you've left them behind? It is better for me not to make any statement on that at all. Because that, that you don't know, that might hurt them. For the wives of some of the hostages waiting in Beirut, it had also been a cruel ordeal. Because until Mr. Singh turned up, they did not know which of the husbands was being released. Today is very happy day for me. And still I didn't see him yet. I want to see him. Mr. Singh, though not an American citizen, has been taken under the American ambassador's wing, and he did little to hide his disappointment that more hostages had not been freed. For too long, the hostages, these innocent persons, have been pawns in an inhuman and cruel political game of terrorism. Such words are unlikely to move the kidnappers, nor is Mr. Singh's release thought to bring freedom for most of the hostages, including the missing Britons, any closer. This is Keith Graves for the 6 o'clock news in the Middle East. President Reagan has said that no deals were done to secure Mr. Singh's freedom, and he said he wouldn't try to guess why he'd been released. Nine Americans are still missing in Beirut. At the White House this morning, much satisfaction over the release of a hostage, but there was no forgetting the others. The president was asked if he knew what had led to the freeing of Mr. Singh. No, and as I say, we, we've done no negotiating uh, on that at all. And uh, I'm not going to hazard any guess as to why they turn him loose, not as long as we've still got hostages there. Do you have any hopes that we'll have additional um, hostages within the next uh, few days or so? Any I haven't seen any indication of that. No indication either from the State Department, but an unusual gesture to the government of Iran. Iran did make efforts on behalf of the hostages. But let me again repeat what we have said over and over again, that we call on Iran and all others to use that influence to obtain the urgent, unconditional release of all the hostages. The Americans don't dare to hope that there'll be further releases, but there is a feeling that Iran may be reaching out to the West and could use its influence with the hostage takers where before it chose not to. This is Tim Sebastian for the 6 o'clock news in Washington. Here, the government has told Kuwait to reduce the number of shares it owns in British Petroleum by more than half. This follows a Monopolies and Mergers Commission report which says Kuwait's holding in BP of nearly 22% is against the public interest. Kuwait could lose £350 million in the sell-off and says it's extremely dissatisfied with the way the Commission reached its conclusion. Richard Branson's music and entertainment group Virgin is to pull out of the stock market after only two years. It's been disappointed at the way their shares have been performing. The management buyout, the biggest of its kind, will cost £200 million. They'll be paying £1.40 a share. That's the same as when the company was first floated. The shares reached a high of 170 pence last year, but in May this year they reached an all-time low of 83 pence. Uh, on analysing it, we felt that this would be the perfect divorce, um, a, a divorce where the shareholders can be happy, uh, where we can be happy, and where I think the city can be happy. The Health Secretary, Kenneth Clark, says the government is determined to introduce regional variations in nurses' pay. He said their salaries should reflect real earnings in different parts of the country. But Trevor Clay, the Secretary of the Royal College of Nursing, opposed the move. He said imposing another change would cause turbulence of a high order among nurses. The inquest has opened into the King's Cross fire, which killed 31 people last November. But according to a lawyer acting for many of the families of the dead, they won't be represented after today because they can't afford the legal costs. The lawyer, Ian Walker, said London Underground had refused to pay and the families didn't have the money themselves. Yet, he said, this is the inquest which will investigate the deaths of those they loved. The inquest is being held in the Shaw Theatre, only a short distance from King's Cross tube station. 
The disaster has already been the subject of the longest official investigation in English legal history. That investigation had to decide what happened and why. The inquest has to determine how, when and where the 31 victims died. Unlike most other interested parties, the families of 27 victims won't be legally represented because they can't afford it. What's happening in there is that there are councils standing up for um, LRT, LRT workers, the firemen and the transport police and they're cross-examining the witnesses. There's nobody there cross-examining the witnesses for the deceased. But you do have the chance, if you wish, to ask questions for yourself. It's not so easy for us, is it? It's, more, it's much easier if, if you're a solicitor or a lawyer, whatever you are. The coroner is also hoping to find out the name of the unidentified victim known only by his mortuary tag number of 115. Despite an expert's reconstruction of his features, nobody has positively identified him. Today, a dentist said 115 had a tooth with a distinctive scratch, but inquiries within the dental profession hadn't produced a name. The inquest is expected to last about three weeks. After the jury have returned their verdict, the report of the much more detailed official investigation will be published. A public inquiry into plans to build another nuclear power station at Hinkley Point in Somerset has opened with opponents of the scheme suffering an immediate setback. The inspector rejected appeals for an adjournment, which would have allowed more time for them to prepare their case. There are already two nuclear power stations at Hinkley Point, and this inquiry must decide whether the CEGB can build Britain's second pressurised water reactor on the site. The first PWR is being built at Sizewell, where the inquiry took two and a half years to complete. It was a fairly muted start to the inquiry. A handful of protesters trailed a white elephant through the village streets. They may not have been as vocal as the protesters at previous nuclear inquiries, but they claim to be better organised. There have been more than 13,000 formal objections to the proposal. So what are the arguments? The opponents say Hinkley C would be unsafe, unnecessary and uneconomic. The CGB dispute all three claims. First, is it unsafe? The objectors claim that if there were an accident and radioactivity escaped, emergency arrangements would be inadequate. Thousands of people in this part of Somerset could die of cancer. The CGB say it will be safe. It's the same design as the Sizewell reactor on which workers started and which was accepted as safe at the Sizewell inquiry. The Chernobyl disaster has caused people to be more wary of nuclear power, but the CGB say that was a completely different type of reactor and not relevant to Britain. Next, objectors say Hinkley Point C is unnecessary. Energy demand is not growing as fast as had been expected. All the um, predictions that the CEGB has made, and I see they are now coyly re refusing to make predictions, but all the predictions they have made about generating need in the future have been wildly overestimated in terms of what actually was required at the time. But the CEGB disagree. They maintain they need Hinkley Point C because without it, energy demand will exceed supply by 1995. And there's another reason. We need nuclear power stations because we are heavily dependent on coal. 80% of our electricity comes from coal-fired power stations. We don't want all our eggs in one basket. Third, opponents claim Hinkley C will be uneconomic compared with coal. But the CGB disagree. Over 40 years, they say Hinkley C will produce very cheap electricity. When the industry is privatised, 20% of electricity has to come from non-fossil fuels and nuclear power is the only realistic source, they say. And they point out that burning coal causes the greenhouse effect, which is a threat to the environment. Nuclear power doesn't cause that problem. But a privatised industry may look at nuclear power differently. If investors see it as a risk, they may be unwilling to support it in the future. Our science correspondent, James Wilkinson, reporting. Later in the programme, A Father's Justice, How Bernard Proctor Trapped the Man Who Killed His Son. And hello hero, Rotherham welcomes Peter Elliott and his medal. Now the time is 6.17. The headlines tonight, Neil Kinnock has told Labour it must adopt policies which have the support of the people. The greatest concession to Thatcherism, he told the conference, would be to let it win again. An IRA bomb has killed a prison officer in Northern Ireland. It exploded as he drove his car through East Belfast. 
And the hostage released in Beirut last night, Metalashwa Singh, has said he was treated better than he was expected, but there is no substitute for freedom. Tomorrow, the people of Chile go to the polls to decide whether General Augusto Pinochet should remain as president. In the plebiscite, they can vote only yes or no to Pinochet. There are no other candidates. If he gets a majority, he'll remain in power for another eight years. If he loses, elections must be called, but not before December next year, and he could stay in office until March 1990. A report from our foreign affairs editor in Santiago. As the most important moment in Chile's political life since the 1973 coup draws closer, some very strange things have been happening here. The other night on the government television station, for instance, they were broadcasting the final speech of the referendum campaign by President Pinochet. He'd just reached his last sentence when he was cut off in mid-gesture. The sound waves had been hijacked. <laughs> It was, the voice said, a broadcast by Radio Liberation, the broadcasting arm of a far-left-wing terrorist group. And while the news bulletin blithely continued talking about Mr. Gorbachev, the front was urging people to buy guns and knives for the moment when the result of the vote was announced. Today, the streets of Santiago are heavily patrolled and things are unusually quiet. The Pinochet government has long used the threat of left-wing violence as a way of persuading people that Chile needs strong authoritarian government. So the clandestine broadcast suited the government's line extremely well. Too well, its opponents are saying. In fact, the illegal Communist Party here nowadays takes a rather mild approach, albeit on tactical grounds. Its senior figures, like the spokesman, Jose Sanfuentes, are nervous and hard to contact. But he did meet party members at a carefully arranged meeting in Santiago. He said the communists, like their far-left revolutionary allies, want people to go out on the streets and celebrate, assuming there's a no vote tomorrow, but the party didn't want them to use violence. The moderate politicians campaigning for a no vote are much more publicly against violence, knowing that it would only play into the government's hand. So far, because there hasn't been too much trouble, people have felt free to consider voting no on the grounds that it would be a personal vote against President Pinochet himself. The government side is understandably anxious that the vote shouldn't just be a personal judgment on the president, but on the stability and growing prosperity his rule is providing. Chile, the deputy interior minister insists, is a perfectly normal democracy nowadays with free parties and free political expression. In a shantytown outside Santiago, a no campaigner is showing people who've never voted in their lives how it's done. Their faith in the power of the ballot box, even an imitation one made of cardboard, is intense. We want democracy, that's why we're voting no, he says. This is John Simpson for the 6 o'clock news in Santiago. Refugees who fled to Ethiopia to escape war and famine in neighbouring Sudan are facing a new crisis, the threat of disease from the worst floods in that region for 20 years. 200,000 refugees now live in the Itang camp in western Ethiopia, but it's been largely underwater since the Barrow River burst its banks. Our East Africa correspondent, Mike Waldridge, has been there. It has in many ways been a refugee camp waiting for a disaster to happen. The floods, it's feared, could trigger that disaster. As the Sudanese civil war has intensified and more and more refugees have flocked into Itang, the unsuitability of the site for such large numbers has become obvious. Drainage in particular has been one of the main problems. It's estimated that 45,000 of the camp's inhabitants have been directly affected by the floods. Many have been living for up to two months like this, families sharing huts that have remained above the water level. The United Nations High Commission for Refugees has provided 500 tents, but they're hot to live in and have generally not proved popular. Some of the refugees have sought to put the flood water to good use, but at a risk. Several people have been attacked and killed by crocodiles, and as the water steadily becomes more stagnant, the health hazards increase. 
Food supplies have been disrupted by the floods and a shortage of lorries. The camp has just five days' worth of cereal stocks at present. The strains on this camp are likely to become even greater in the next few weeks. Assuming that the fighting and the famine continue at the same level inside southern Sudan, it's forecast that there could be as many as 20,000 new <coughs> refugees coming into Itang each month once the floods go down. Some have made a desperate attempt to reach Itang during the rains. The latest to get through, weak and hungry after a trek of up to three months, tell of 40 people who were swept away in a swollen river on the Sudanese side of the border. Sunday morning service at one of the ten churches in the camp, the packed congregation, a reminder that it's partly to protect their Christian faith against what they see as Muslim domination, that many southern Sudanese are willing to support the war despite all the hardships it's brought them. This is Mike Woodridge for the 6 o'clock news in Itang refugee camp, Ethiopia. A father whose son was killed in a hit-and-run accident five years ago turned detective when the driver came out of prison and photographed him breaking the law again. Bernard Proctor felt the original sentence, nine months jail and a four-and-a-half-year driving ban, was too lenient, and so he trailed Gordon Stratton for more than a year, gathering evidence which he then gave to the police. Today, Stratton was sent back to jail and disqualified again after admitting two charges of driving while banned. Ben Brown reports. Timothy Proctor was a brighter-than-average schoolboy, passionate about pop music and passionate about darts. He's pictured here with his hero, the darts champion Eric Bristow. Shortly before his 15th birthday, Timothy was crossing this dual carriageway in South London when he was hit by a car. Instead of stopping, the driver, Gordon Stratton, simply carried on for 400 yards with Timothy on the bonnet. Eventually, he swerved, hurling the boy off. Timothy later died of head injuries. Stratton was jailed for reckless driving and banned from the road for four and a half years. But Timothy's father was determined that Stratton should never be allowed to drive again. With the quickly acquired skills of a detective, he tracked Stratton down to this pub. He converted his aging van into a surveillance vehicle and day in, day out, for more than a year, he waited and watched until he captured on film Stratton breaking his driving ban. With the help of Mr Proctor's photographic evidence, Stratton was jailed again today for nine months. The judge said it was a particularly appalling case. He also imposed another driving ban of a year. I'm sure that there's going to be other parents that's probably going to say, why didn't I do that and sort this person out? And I think in the future now, you're going to find that more people are going to start sorting these things out for themselves as well. It's worked with me, so it can work with them. Timothy's father admits that his campaign against Stratton became a virtual obsession, but it's an obsession he says will last for as long as the memory of the son he lost. Ben Brown reporting. A team of Soviet military inspectors is flying to Britain early tomorrow after giving only 36 hours notice that they want to inspect a British army exercise. The Russians are using their right of inspection for the first time in Britain under a two-year-old treaty designed to reduce east-west tensions. The Ministry of Defence has denied tonight that the exercise, Drake's Drum, breaches any obligations under that treaty. They said the numbers involved were considerably lower than the threshold at which other countries could insist on inspecting. Britain's Olympic athletes came home today, some in triumph with medals to show to the waiting cameras. For others, there was the memory of having taken part in the world's greatest sporting event and the dream of doing better next time. Linford Christie arrived back to a barrage of photographers and reporters and an ecstatic welcome from family and friends. Christie won silver medals in the 100 metres and the 4 by 100 metres relay. Today he said the reception was great, but he didn't want to talk about the drugs issue. Christie gave a positive drugs test but was cleared of cheating and in the 100 metres he was upgraded to silver after Ben Johnson's disqualification. He promised there were even better performances to come. I'll come over with two silver here, so next time I think it'll be two gold. Others, including the rowing gold medalist Stephen Redgrave, admitted the whole question of drugs had overshadowed the Games. It has marred it a bit, and the drugs being involved, and, but I think it's a good thing that some of the top people have been caught. 
Nick Gillingham, who won the silver medal in the 200 metres breaststroke, said the drugs testing should have been even more stringent. Each and every medalist should have been drug tested, and I know for a fact that everybody wasn't. For the fact I didn't have a drug test, and I feel that certainly the top three and, and maybe the fourth and fifth places as well should all undergo drug testing. There was a big welcome for Britain's only boxing medalist, Richard Woodall, who won a bronze in the light middleweight division. He kept his comments decidedly uncontroversial. Oh, over the moon. Over the moon about it. Great. Tessa Sanderson put on a brave face, though she's still suffering from the injury, which wrecked her chances of retaining her javelin title. The men's hockey team, who unexpectedly won the gold, returned to begin their celebrations in earnest. We've had a bit of time now, what, three or four days to relax after the event, and uh, champagne's been going down very well, thank you. <laughs> Peter Elliott took the silver in the 1500 metres. He had to fight his way through the crowds to the door of the family home in Rotherham. These people see me training every day, it's as much theirs as it is mine, and uh, it's great to have people out. Several hundred people were there. Elliot, quite overwhelmed by the reception, said his priority was to recover from his groin injury and then start training again. Tributes have been paid today to the man who changed the shape of British motoring, Sir Alec Isagonis, the designer of, among other things, the Morris Minor and the Mini, who died yesterday aged 81. Sir Alec helped revolutionise the way small cars are built by turning their engines round, and he was still looking at ways of improving small cars until, to, uh, until a few months before his death. Sir Alec's concept was devastating and so simple. The engine was too long, so you turned it sideways, stuffed the gearbox underneath, and created a small car that turned the industry upside down. He'd already designed the Morris 1000, a car, they said, with a performance that a tired pedestrian might rival, but one that made friends then and still does now. The Mini, still a Spartan exercise in basic motoring, was in a different gear. As they rolled off the production lines from the 50s into the 60s, the 70s, and then the 80s, Sir Alec Isigonis had set the standard for small car design. It had a split personality, part runabout, part racer, though he disapproved of the more exuberant manifestations of mini motoring. The accountants called it a failure. There was lots of imagination, not much profit in its first 15 years. But that verdict says more about accountants than minis. The motoring press, of course, knew better. They saw to it that John Lennon and anybody who was anybody in the 60s had his photo taken behind the wheel of the new car. Getting behind the wheel became a cult in a decade of oddball achievements. Sir Alec worked largely alone. He was the man who described a camel as a horse designed by committee. His car remains in production after 29 years, a vehicle designed to be shorter than most that's lasted a good deal longer than most. Sir Alec Isagonis. And that was the six o'clock news on Tuesday the 4th of October. Neil Kinnock told Labour that a price had to be paid for victory. Policies had to be popular. He told the party conference the greatest concession to thank